Welcome, I'm Robert Breaker, and I've got a sermon prepared for you today that I believe is so important, so very, very important. We're going to talk about the nation of Israel. And I want to take you to as many scriptures as I possibly can, because I want to show you what the Bible says about Israel. Now, there was a, uh, I can't remember which king it was, but many years ago there was a king, I believe it was a king of England, and uh, they asked their chaplain, this king of England, how do we know the Bible's true? And the chaplain said, well, that's easy, the Jews. What did they mean by that? Well, this book, our Bible, it, the entire book is written by Jews. And this book is full of prophecy by Jews prophesying. And much of what they did prophesy was about what will happen to the Jewish nation. And it did. So how do we know the Bible's true? Well, all of the prophecies given are fulfilled. Now, there's still some future ones that haven't been fulfilled yet. We're going to look at some of those today. But how do we know the Bible's true? We look at the Jew. And we see that the Jew is God's chosen people. And that God spoke to them. God, the creator of the universe, told the Jews certain things. And he used some of them as prophets to prophesy certain things, and they came to pass. So there must be a God, because he has told us in advance what would happen, and it happens. So God is true, and we look at the Jews, because the Jews help us to understand. And we look at the Bible, and we understand. And so we look at the Jews, and we go, wow, God, God is using the Jews. He's used the Jewish people. And what does the Bible say about Jews in the future? Well, some today teach that God is completely done with the Jews. I don't believe that. I'm going to talk about that today. Today we're going to look at Israel and the last days. I'm going to go to the Bible and ask the question, Is God done with the Jews? Is God completely finished with the nation of Israel? If so, why is there a nation of Israel today? <laughs> There's some people that go out, and these people, they try to teach that God is done with the Jews. Their doctrine is called replacement theology. And what they teach, and this is very, very um, prevalent today in the church, many churches today preach replacement theology. And what that teaches is that God is done with the Jews. So they say God is completely done with the Jews. Well, let me say it better, with the nation of Israel. So they say God is completely done with the nation of Israel. There's no such thing as Jews. God's finished with Israel. All of the promises that God gave to them are now to the church. Is that true? Is that what the Bible teaches? Well, as we go through the scriptures and we look at the Bible, we find, no. No, not on your life. It's impossible to say that God is completely done with the Jews. That would negate many of the promises in the Bible that are still future for the nation of Israel. So I'm going to show you today, and I'm going to prove from the Scriptures that replacement theology is not biblical. God is not done with the Jews as a nation. The nation of Israel is prophesied of in the Scriptures, and it talks about the nation in the latter days. And so we will see that God is not done. Now, this is the timeline of the Bible. So this is our Bible timeline. The Bible timeline is a pre-tribulational timeline. This right here is the rapture. After the rapture comes the time called the tribulation. This is when God begins to deal with Israel again. This right here is the church. Now, these people that believe in replacement theology, most, if not all of them, their timeline looks like this. This would be the timeline of those that believe in replacement theology. Let's look at how their timeline differs. A replacement theology person, they agree that the law existed and that Israel did exist. They agree that there is the church. But the replacement theology people, they think that the, that the tribulation comes and then the rapture. So these people, and some of them say a mid-tribulation rapture. 
So I'll put that there. Not as So what they do is these people that believe in replacement theology, they believe that the tribulation is for the world and for the church. And so they say, no, there's no rapture. They say, and they teach, that Christians have to go through the tribulation. Now that's not a biblical teaching, and I don't have time to get into that today. But they say God's done with Israel, so there's no Israel, so I guess that, I guess I have to put it this way, I guess, according to their teaching, the rapture takes place as soon as Jesus comes back at Armageddon. And then he sets up his millennial kingdom. Some of them don't even believe in a millennium. So there are people out there today that believe what they call replacement theology. These people that believe in replacement theology say that the church replaced Israel. And there is no future time in which God goes back to dealing with the nation of Israel. God is finished with the Jews. Let's find out if that's a Bible teaching. We're going to go to a lot of scriptures today, and I'm going to show you what the Bible says about that. Let's begin in Deuteronomy chapter 7. I'm not giving my opinion. I'm not giving what my denomination says. I'm not going to tell you what, uh, you know, what men of the past have written in books and things like that. We're going to the scriptures themselves to see if replacement theology is true or not. Replacement theology says God was so angry with Israel, he said, you're done. Now I'm only dealing with the church. And replacement theology says there's no more Israel, no more Jews, no more going back to that nation. Well, we have a problem because God swore an oath to the nation of Israel to do something forever. If God does not fulfill that oath, then God is a liar. Replacement theology makes God a liar. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. And in Deuteronomy chapter 7, we're going to read verses 6 through 10. This is God speaking to the nation of Israel. Deuteronomy 7, 6 says, For thou art an holy people. Who is he speaking to? The nation of Israel. Unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. So God is talking to Israel in the Old Testament. And God says to Israel, He says, You are my chosen people. He says, you're special. He says, you're a special people. So God is speaking to Israel, and he says, they're his chosen people. Now it says here, verse 7, The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. 8, But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, Hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen and from the hand of Pharaoh the king? So God said he swore an oath to Israel. What could that oath be? All right, continuing there, verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. God's talking to Israel, and he says, to a thousand generations. Do you know how many a thousand generations there are? Well, we're told in the Bible that a generation is 70 years. 70 times a thousand, that would be 70,000 generations. <laughs> Does that sound like to you that God says, well, I started out good with Israel, but I said, forget it, and I gave up on them, and I'm done with them? He said he wouldn't be done with them until a thousand generations of those Jews passed. So right off the bat, replacement theology is not looking like a Bible doctrine. And he says there that there's a covenant that, that he made with them. We're going to look at this oath or this covenant. Okay, now let's continue here. What does it say here? And repayeth them that hate him, verse 10, to their face. To destroy them, he will not be slack to him that hateth him, and he will repay him to his face. So the Bible says here in verse 6 that God chose Israel. Israel as a nation is God's chosen people. For how long? Verse 7, a thousand generations. So that's a lot. A thousand generations. That's, that's a lot of people. And then he says in verse 8 that he made an oath to Israel. What is the oath that God swore? You know, Bible, the Bible says God, when he swears, he's got to keep it. Because let God be true, but every man a liar. God is true. When God swears something and makes a promise to someone, he cannot break that promise. So what is the promise? Let's go to Genesis chapter 12. 
I want to go through this as quickly as I can, so I hope I'm not going too fast, but at the same time, I've got a lot of verses I want to show you. And uh, this video, I, more than anything, hopefully will, will help the Jews to realize what, why Christians love Jews. I love the Jewish people because of the Bible, and because the Bible tells me that I should. Now, the first thing I want you to see is that God swears a land. So what does God swear? God's oath. God's covenant, if you will, to Israel. What is it? Well, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, 2, and 3. God appears to a man named Abram. He changes his name later to Abraham. Abraham is the one of which comes the, the Jews from his descendants. And God says in Genesis chapter 12, Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show you. Alright, so Abraham, where is he on our, our chart? Abraham's way back here. Let me put him down below here. Way down here. Abraham. Now, God says to Abraham, I'm going to get you to go to a certain land. Verse 2, And I'll make of thee a great nation, I'll bless thee, and make thy name great, and, thy, and thou shalt be a blessing. Verse 3, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So we have a specific place, a land, a specific place that God says, Abraham, this is where I want you to dwell. And we're going to see that God makes an oath to Abraham that this land will be his land and also the land of his lineage. That is, all of those that come from him, uh, all of the people from his seed. So that's the seed of Abraham. So let's look at that. Genesis chapter 13 and verse 15. God is swearing an oath to this man, Abraham. Let's look at what God says to this man. Genesis chapter 13, verses 15 through 17. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed, watch what he says, for ever. So part of the oath that God gave was an oath of a land forever. Now, how long is forever? It never ends. It doesn't stop. So how could God be done with the Jews? How could God say, you know what? Pfft, I know I told you I'd give you that land forever, but I, I lied. No, God doesn't lie. So when God says forever, we need to pay attention. This means always, forever. And it continues there in Genesis chapter 13, verse 15. And all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. Who is the seed of Abraham? Why, that's the nation of Israel. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. So God made an oath to Abraham that he would give Abraham the seed, or the land, and to his seed the land forever. All right, now let's go to Genesis chapter 15, verses 5 through 7. Genesis 15, 5. And he brought him forth abroad, and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said to him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So, there was a promise made of a land and a lineage, of a specific place and to him to have a seed. And he would have more children than what? than the stars in the heavens. Scientists to this day say, we don't know how many stars there are. There's so many we can't count them. That's a pretty big seed. That's a lot of descendants. That's a grand lineage for Abraham. Verse 7 says, And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. All right, that's an inheritance. An inheritance is what you pass on to your children. Now we go to Genesis chapter 17. Look at Genesis chapter 17, verse 7, 8, and 9. Genesis 17, 7, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee. Okay, there's a covenant. And thy seed after thee in their generations. How long? To a thousand generations. Those 70,000 years, give or take. <laughs> For an everlasting covenant. How long? Everlasting. 
So the oath or, or the covenant is an everlasting covenant. That does not mean that it ends. That means it goes on forever. So God cannot be done with the Jews if he made a covenant with them that will last forever. How on earth could a person say, and now God's done with the Jews, and all the promises God made to them, well, they're no longer promises, when the promises God made were forever. Somebody's got a problem. Now go to, um, where are we here? We're in Genesis 17. Look at verse 8. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. So he calls it an everlasting possession. Probably spelled possession wrong. Let me check that out. Nope, that's right. An everlasting possession. Two S's and two S's. And I will be their God. Verse 9, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. 10, This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you. And he goes on there and he talks about a covenant. So there was an oath that God swore to his chosen people through Abraham, the first Abraham was, the Jews call him the father of the Jews. So now let's go to Genesis chapter 35. But do you see the language of the King James Bible? God didn't say, Abraham, I'm going to give you a land for as long as you can keep it, and you can have it for a little bit, and I'll let your seed have it if they can keep it, and they can have it for a little while. But, but when I'm done with them, then they can't have it anymore. <laughs> no, God didn't speak like that. God said, I will give you this land to your seed forever as an everlasting possession. That means they will have it forever. Sorry, replacement theology. The doctrine of replacement theology does not follow the scriptures. Genesis 35.10, we read, And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply, and nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. So God said, Abraham, your son Isaac and your son Jacob, I give to them too, not just you and to their seed as an everlasting possession forever, this land. Now go to Genesis 48.4. Are you seeing something here? If God swore to give to the nation of Israel a land forever, then the nation of Israel must dwell forever, must exist forever. Otherwise, God's a liar. How could God say, well, there's no more such thing as Jews, they're all done. That doesn't make sense. Genesis 48.4. And said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee, and I will make of thee a multitude of people, and I will give this land to thy seed after thee for an, and here we go again, everlasting possession. Now, is God a liar? God said, hey, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all their seed, that's the twelve tribes of Israel, Jacob's name is Israel, to those people I give the land of Canaan, the land that today we know as the land of Israel, before it was known as the land of Palestine, all that land, God says, belongs to the nation of Israel. Who do you think you are to say that you're a Christian and you believe the Bible and then say, but that's a lie. Don't believe that it's an everlasting possession. Don't believe that it's forever. No, 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 no. God promised it to the Jews, but now it's for us. That's not what God said. God said an everlasting possession to this literal seed of Abraham. You say, why are you so dogmatic? Because it's so sad to see uh, people out there preaching something against God and the Bible. And they're out there saying, there's no such thing as the Jews. The Jews don't exist. And, and God's done with the Jews. And replacement theology, it's the church. It's all the promises go to the church. And you're sitting there going, um, you know what happened in 1947? <laughs> uh, 1947, the United Nations declared that, that the nation of Israel has a right to go back into the land. In 1948, many Jews returned to the land and inhabited to the land. And now we've just celebrated in 2018, 70-year anniversary of the nation of Israel 
How can you say God's done with the Jews, there's no such thing as the Jews, and yet the nation of Israel exists in the land? God must be fulfilling His promise. And it appears He is. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 21. So God came along and He told Abraham and told Isaac, told Jacob, whose name was Israel, the land is yours and to your seed. Then another guy comes along named Moses. And God tells Moses, now Moses, I'm going to give you the law. And what was the law? Well, it was a political thing. Part of a covenant. It was a political thing that becomes part of the covenant that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Deuteronomy 29, 21 says, And the Lord shall separate him unto evil out of all the tribes of Israel, according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in the, this book of the law. So God made a covenant with Israel, and then he said, Now, when you get in the land, this is the law that you keep. For you're my chosen nation, and a nation needs laws. Now let's go to look, Exodus chapter 6. So along comes Moses, and God gives to Moses the law. Now when God is giving Moses the law, look at what God says to Moses. Exodus chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham and unto Isaac and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. And now here in verse 4 he says, And I have also established my covenant, my covenant with them, to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage wherein they were strangers. And I've also heard the groanings of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians put in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. And God says, look, I remembered the covenant that I made. I swore an oath to give Israel the land and to give that land to their seed. And so he says, now, now's the time. Now I'm going to take them out of Egypt. You, Moses, are going to give them the law. And the law is a part of my covenant with them. They must keep these things. They must keep this law. What happened? Well, we know through the Bible that Moses led Israel to the promised land. Joshua fought and took the land as a possession for Israel. That took place about 1500 B.C. Now, old uh, Abraham lived more or less about 2000 B.C. before Christ. But the Bible clearly teaches that God promised Abraham a seed and a land forever. He promised that to this seed will be this land as an everlasting possession. How long is forever? How long is everlasting? Always. There's no end to everlasting. So how could someone say, well, God's done with the Jews and that promise is no longer for them? That's not a Bible doctrine. Somebody is lying to you if they teach replacement theology. And they're going against the Scriptures. So did the children of Israel keep the land? Well, unfortunately, no. As we read through the scriptures, we find out that because of their sin, God brought Babylon in, defeated the nation of Israel, and the nation of Israel went into captivity around the year 600 B.C. What was it, 606 or something like that? But if God had kept them out forever after that, then God would be a liar. You know what happened after 70 years? The nation of Israel returned. They got the land back. Now, Jesus shows up around 3 B.C. Now, let me show you what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that God swore an oath to Abraham and his seed to give them a land. The seed would be his lineage. That oath goes to his lineage. God said, there's a law that I want to be a part of this covenant. And you've got to keep my law when you're in the land. And then God says, you know what else I'm going to promise? I'm going to promise a lawgiver. I'm going to promise to send you someone, a specific person. Uh, 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 I'm going to send you, we'll see later, a prince. He's going to be called Messiah. So God gave all these promises to Israel. And guess what? They all came true. But they aren't promises that He just said, I'll do this one time and forget it. 
They're everlasting promises. That means they go on till the end of time. God has not forgotten this promise that he made to Israel. So when you go to Deuteronomy chapter 18, and I don't, I'm not going to go there right now, but Deuteronomy chapter 18, O Moses says he will rise up a prophet unto you. And the P is a capital P. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the Messiah. I'll send the Messiah. He's going to be the prophet. That was Jesus Christ. But the Jews rejected Jesus Christ. What happened? When the Jews rejected their Messiah, they said crucify him, and they killed him, and he died on the cross. In 70 AD, God was so angry that they rejected their Messiah that he destroyed he sent in the Romans. They destroyed the temple. The Jews were dispersed. So the Jews were dispersed for almost 2,000 years. They were scattered, is another word we could use, among the world. And so for almost 2,000 years, the nation of Israel did not exist. And the nation of Israel did not have the land. People that were of this lineage were scattered all throughout Europe and other countries. And they were sad, and they were all, oh, that we would have our land back. Now, who dispersed them? Go to Ezekiel chapter 36. I'm going to give you pure scripture today. God was so angry with the nation of Israel for destroying and, and killing their Messiah, even though that was his plan to die for them, that he's the one that sent judgment. And, that, and made them, as a punishment, have to leave their land. Just as he did back here with Babylon. When they went into sin, he sent in Babylon, and they went into captivity for 70 years. Well, over here, they go into captivity for almost 2,000 years. And they're, I guess you could say captivity, but they're scattered among the nations, and they don't have their land because of their sin. Now, that's not God lying and forgetting his promise. Not in your life. I'm going to show you from the scriptures that God's plan was to bring them back. Because he remembered his oath that they would get that land forever. And he hasn't forgotten. So what does it say in Ezekiel chapter 36? Ezekiel 36, 24. Look at what it says here in the word of God. Ezekiel 36, 24. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. God promised again. You see, the whole Old Testament, over and over and over and over, God keeps promising them that oath that he promised them from the beginning. And he says in verse 25, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And he continues here, all the way down to verse 28. And ye shall dwell in your land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. This is the book of Ezekiel, written about 500 and something before Christ. And God says, I'm going to give you that land back, even though you're dispersed. You're going to get it back. Well, 70 AD, they were scattered, they were dispersed throughout all nations. And then we saw one of the greatest miracles in the history of the world. 1947, the UN said, go on back. And they went back. They fought a little bit of war to get that land back. But guess what? 1948, they founded themselves as a nation again. And now there is, again, a nation of Israel. Now people say, well, those aren't the real Jews. I don't know anything about that. All I know is the Bible says that he said that seed will exist. Because how could he give something to someone that doesn't exist? You see, the argument of the replacement theology people is there's no such thing as Jews. I don't know who the true Jews are. I know the Bible does talk about some false Jews. But God promised to the true Jews that land. So I'm going to let God figure out who the true Jews are and who aren't. I'm not going to go against the scriptures. I'm going to teach what the Bible teaches. And the Bible teaches that God will bring back the Jews to the land. And guess what? Oh, he did. He must have because the land's there again and the nation is there again. Now, they'll dwell in their land. So God's not done with the nation of Israel. There are countless, countless verses in the Bible in which God says Israel will go back to their land and inhabit it forever. So the rest of this teaching, what I want to do is I want to take you to Old Testament prophecies of God in which he says these things to Israel. 
And what we're going to see is replacement theology will not work. It goes against the promise of God to teach that God is done with the Jews and done with Israel. That's not what the Bible teaches. Hopefully these will strengthen your faith. Hopefully you'll see this in the Bible and you'll say, Oh wow, yeah, I agree with you, Brother Breaker. God's not done with the Jews. Again, this isn't a, a teaching on who the Jews are. Like I say, I'm not going to go into the, the Hasidic Jews or the, the Akhenasi or whatever they're called. and I'm not trying in this sermon to say who the Jews are. God knows. All I know is God said He would give them a land back and He would give it to the right people. And it'd be in the last days. So there must be some Jews, and God knows who they are. And they must get their land back. Because that is the promise. That is the oath. Now, go to uh, Isaiah 45, verse 17. Isaiah chapter 45, 17 through 25. Look at what it says in Isaiah 45, 17. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Why is it God's always talking to Israel and He's always saying everlasting, forever, always? <laughs> With an everlasting salvation, ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. Now, he continues here, 18, For thus saith the, the Lord that created the heavens, God Himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it, He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. So God is speaking to Israel and saying, I am your God. I'm God the Creator, the one you worship, the one that made the oath with you. Verse 19, I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, Seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord... I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Verse 20, Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. What happened? They were dispersed. They were scattered among the nations. God's telling them, now come back. If you are a Jew, one of those of the lineage that, that had to leave Israel, come back. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. Verse 21, Tell ye, and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? God. God from ancient time, way back in the time of Abraham, made a promise. He swore an oath to give the land to the lineage of a certain man. So that lineage of that certain man must still be around today. And it says here, Have not I the Lord, and there is none else besides me, a just God and a Savior, there is none besides me. Verse 22, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. Verse 23, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return. That unto me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear. Surely I say one, surely shall one say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. Now look at what it says in verse 25. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and show glory. So there's a seed of Israel that's going to glory in God and be justified. Now people say, but, but you're wrong, Mr. Breaker. The seed today is us who are Christians because we're counted of the lineage of Abraham. Yeah, spiritually. But I'm not talking about spiritually. I'm talking about physical seed from a man. His physical lineage. And I'm going to prove to you that that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about any spiritual seed here. He's talking about the physical seed of Abraham. And the Bible is very clear about that. I'm going to show you that. Now let's go to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah 23 verses 3 through 8. Now some will say, well this is just a past prophecy. I'm going to show you another verse to prove that this is a future prophecy. And it prophesies of what happened here in this time. But I want you to read this here. This is a prophecy of God to bring Israel back. Jeremiah 23, 3. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up, set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be them dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Well, that's Jesus Christ. When does Jesus Christ reign in the earth? The millennial kingdom. So this must be talking about the latter days. Verse 6, In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. It's talking about Jesus Christ. 
And it says God's going to save Judah and all Israel. Not just Jews, Judah. Some people say, Jews only means Judah. Oh, okay. Well, here it says, in his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel. <laughs> Both. Okay? Verse 7, Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, and from all countries whither I have driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. Who is that? The literal seed of Abraham. That's what it's talking about. Now, let's go over to Jeremiah chapter 30. You say, oh, Brother Breaker, no, it's talking about the spiritual seed. Okay, let's go. Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 3. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. All right, verse 4. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great. Which day? What day is he talking about? That day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble for he shall be saved out of it. The tribulation period is called the time of Jacob's trouble. Who is Jacob? Well, Jacob is Israel. So this must be the trouble of Israel. Jacob's trouble is the tribulation period. This tribulation period is for Israel, not for the church. So people have to twist the scriptures to say that the church is going to go through the tribulation. But they're not. The church gets out so that God can go back to dealing with Israel. Shall we stop there in verse 7? Let's look at verse 10. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed. O Israel. It doesn't say, O church. <laughs> he says, O Israel. For lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. Now watch what it says in verse 11. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. But I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether and punished. God says, I will not make a full end of you. Replacement theology says God made a full end of the Jews, and that there's no more Jews, and God's not dealing with the Jews ever again. And God did not say that. Man said that, and man is lying when they tell you that. God is not done with the Jewish people. God is not done with the nation of Israel. Now let me show you the context of Jeremiah chapter 30. Go to the last um, couple of verses. Jeremiah 30, verse 22. And ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goeth forth with fury, a continuing whirlwind. It shall fall with pain upon the head of the wicked. Verse 24. The fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he have done it, until he have performed the intents of his heart. In the latter days ye shall consider it. I call this Israel in the last days. Because you cannot help but read your Bible and see that God made a promise to Israel. And that promise must be all the way through to the last days. Why? Because he said it's forever. It's an everlasting promise, everlasting, eternal promise of God to Israel. So this must be God speaking about the tribulation and going back to Israel during the tribulation time. How anyone can deny this makes you wonder about that kind of person. Do they even read the Bible? Probably not. That's why they get into false doctrine and believe uh, traditions of men and believe a teaching of, of, of what's it called, uh, replacement theology. Isaiah chapter 54, verses 1 through 8. Let's look at some more verses. All right, I'm showing you that God says that in the latter days, He's going back to save Israel. How could He do that in the latter days if there is no Israel? Oh, that's right, there is. Israel came back as a nation in 1948. So, <laughs> make sense? So they must still be here somewhere. Otherwise, God couldn't fulfill His promise to give it to that seed. Now, you go to Isaiah chapter 54, look at verses 1 through 8. 
Sing, O barren, thou didst not bear, that didst not bear. Break forth into singing, and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles. Wait a minute. The majority of the people in the church that are saved today are Gentiles. And what these replacement theology people say is, well, the church, that's, that's Israel today. Well, the church, most of the church is Gentiles. God is talking to Israel, and he says, you're going to in, in, inherit the Gentiles. In the tribulation, the Gentiles, God cast out his wrath upon the world, and the Jews have to go through the tribulation, the time of Jacob's troubles. But in the millennium, Jesus comes back and rules in the nation of Israel, on the throne of David in Jerusalem, over who? Why, he is a Jew in the Jewish nation, and the Jews are here on the earth, and they inherit the Gentiles. Verse 4, Fear not, for thou shalt be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. Verse 5, For the, thy Maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken, and grieved in spirit, and a wife of use, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. Now watch what he says here in verse 7. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. So God says, look, I swore an oath to you. For a little time I've forsaken you. You know, I've, I've let you go into captivity here. I've given you captivity. You're scattered. But he says, you know, I'm going to gather you back. I haven't forgotten my oath. Verse 8. In a little wrath, I hide my face from thee for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, there's the word, everlasting, everlasting, with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saying the Lord, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. What do you think the little wrath is? God pours out his wrath upon the world during the tribulation. So after a little bit of wrath, then God goes back to the nation of Israel. He, he allows them to go through this time of trouble, and then, in the Millennial Kingdom, God rules on the throne of David. Israel, as a nation, comes back and inherits the land and is with Jesus Christ, their Messiah, for a thousand years. That's what the Bible says. I mean, that's not my opinion. That's just what the Bible says. I don't believe in replacement theology. Let me, let me show you how smart God is. Deuteronomy chapter 4. These people come along and they say, no, replacement theology, and God's done with the Jews, and, and there's no such thing as Israel or Jews today, and, and nowhere in the Bible does it say that God will go back to dealing with the nation of Israel. And you go, <laughs> you ever read the Bible, buddy? Look at what God says. He's so smart, he writes it in the beginning of the book about what he's going to do with Israel at the end of the book. He's writing the book of Deuteronomy here, and he's about to tell us about something here. And the context is this literal seed. Watch what he says in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy is part of the law. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 29. Deuteronomy 4.29 says, are you ready for this? But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thine heart and with all thy soul. Verse 30, when thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, <laughs> God says, by the way, when you guys are still alive, the Jews, the literal lineage of Abraham, when you guys are still alive, and you're in the tribulation, this is going to happen. People say, oh no, Brother Breaker, it's not saying the tribulation, it's not talking about that. Oh, it's not? Let's continue reading, please. When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days... Why, that would be the tribulation of the latter days, right there. That, that's that time. What does that mean? That means God cannot be done with the Jews, with the race of the people of Israel. God's not done with them. He says there will be a time when they're all still alive, physically, from the physical seed of Abraham, in the tribulation in the latter days. What these people try to do that teach this, Replacement theologies, they probably tell you, well, when the Jews were scattered and dispersed, why they mixed with everybody else and everybody, and they didn't keep a pure lineage, and so there's no such thing as Jew anymore. So why on earth would God tell Jews 
And by the way, when you're in the last days in the tribulation, in the latter days, they wouldn't even be there. It doesn't make sense unless there still is the seed of Abraham somewhere on this earth. Now they say, well, replacement theology teaches that, that um, the seed of Abraham is really us who are saved. We're, we're the spiritual seed. Yeah, but we leave at the rapture. We don't go into the tribulation. But they try to tell you that you do. I don't listen to man. I listen to the Bible and what the Bible says. And the Bible is very clear. Look what he says here in verse 31. Verse 30, he says, When you are in tribulation in the latter days, verse 31, For the Lord thy God is a merciful God. He will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he swear unto them. Deuteronomy chapter 4 is Moses under the law speaking to the literal lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he says that God will remember the literal lineage of Abraham, Isaac, the seed, in the latter days in the tribulation. And he says God will not destroy them. Replacement theology teaches that God is done with the Jews and he destroyed them. I think we could just put a big old X on replacement theology. It's not in the Bible. The Jews are still the chosen people of God to this day. And they exist somewhere. And they have a nation in the land of the place where God swore that they were supposed to have. That's what the Bible teaches. If you want to believe otherwise, you help yourself. You can be a heretic if you want to. <laughs> you know, it's a free country. You can be a heretic if you so desire. But if you want to be a Bible believer, well, come on over to the Bible side and believe what the Bible teaches. God's not done with the nation of Israel. And somewhere on this earth are the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that people exists because God promised to give to them that land. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 4 and 5. God is so dogmatic about this that he's... He's, he says this in verse 4, If any of thine be driven out unto the uttermost or outmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. Verse 5, And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. This is God speaking. God does not believe in replacement theology. Why do you? God says, you Jews, I don't care where you went when you got scattered. If you, if you somehow got off the planet Earth and you were in the uttermost parts of the heaven, God said, I'm going to take all you Jews, all those that I know are from that line, and I will put them right back into the land which their fathers possessed. Replacement theology people say, no, 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 all the promises to Israel are now to the church. All right, I'm a Christian. I'm saved. I'm a part of the body of Christ, the church. My father's never owned any land in Israel. So that can't be applying to me. <laughs> that must be applying to the nation of Israel. The literal seed, not the spiritual seed. The literal seed. Why do people disobey God? Why, do, why don't people read the Bible? Where does this leave this teaching of replacement theology? Why, it clearly shows us that it is a false anti-biblical teaching. There is no replacement theology in the Bible. There is a promise of God to go back to the nation of Israel and to give them what he promised he would give their fathers. And he's going to do it. He's going to do it. Let's go to Micah chapter 7. I just, for the life of me, I cannot believe how anyone could swallow the lie of replacement theology. How anyone could say, oh, I believe in replacement theology. <laughs> what you've just done is you've just told me that you've never read the Bible. Because if you read the Bible, you could never, ever accept such a fallacy, such a false teaching. Micah chapter 7, look at what verse 18 and 19 and 20 say. Micah 7, 18, Who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. 19, He will turn again, he will give, have compassion upon us, he will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all our sins into the depth of the sea. Now verse 20. Thou wilt perform the truth of Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. God made an oath to Abraham 
forever and an everlasting possession will be the land to his seed. His seed is Israel. There is a literal, physical seed in this world today of Jews. Now, who are they? Where are they? I don't know. But all I know is the Bible says that, so I believe it. And whoever they are, and they're probably over there now, because the nation has been formed. I'm sure there are a lot of people in Israel that aren't Jews, but then there are those that are. And they come from the little uh, lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can deny it all you want, but that's what the Bible says. If you deny it, then God's a liar when He promised to give something to those people. How could promise, God promise to give land to a certain people if that people no longer exists? <laughs> Wouldn't that make God a liar? Isaiah chapter 9. So, we clearly see God's promise of a land. And that land was the specific place. It's all the land of Canaan. It's all around Israel, Palestine, all that area belongs to this people, this seed. God used Moses and he gave them a law so they could set themselves up as a nation. And then in that law, we have the promise of the lawgiver, the Messiah. Now, the Bible tells us that this lawgiver that we know is Jesus, the Messiah, the Bible tells us that he's going to reign. He's going to literally sit on the throne in Israel. So the Messiah is going to reign on the throne. So that's going to be on the millennial kingdom. And where does he reign? Where is the throne of Jesus Christ when he reigns in the millennial kingdom? Well, we've got those prophecies too. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So we're told that the man who gave the law, which we know is God, came and he will be a king. And he will rule over the people of Israel. He's going to have a government. He's going to rule. Where do you think he rules from? <laughs> Well, let's look at some more places before I tell you that, but go to Isaiah chapter 24. For him to rule, who does he rule over? He rules over what? The seed of Abraham, because he's in the throne of David. David was a Jew. So there must still be Jews. Isaiah 24, <clears throat> 21. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high, and the kings of the earth upon the earth. 22, and they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days shall they be visited. 23, then the moon shall be confounded, and the sun ashamed, when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and before his ancients, glory. So the throne that Jesus sits on is the throne in Jerusalem. Now, why would God sit on a throne in Jerusalem? Well, in the 1800s, this replacement theology teaching was very big. And there was a man named Mark Twain who went over and he took a tour of Israel. And he kept a journal. I bought that journal uh, and uh, read it. And everything was a, just waste. Everywhere you looked was a wasteland, according to him. And people began to read his thing and say, See, replacement theology, there's nothing over there. It'll never happen. But they didn't read the prophecies in the Bible in which God said he's going to rebuild. He said in the Bible that he would rebuild the wasteland. Whenever the Jews came back to their land in 1947 and set themselves up as a nation in 1948, all these replacement theology people went, uh-oh. <laughs> Here we are 70 years later. All the places have been rebuilt. All the scriptures have been fulfilled. Or many of them, there's still some future ones. But you look at Israel today and you say, wow. So the only way that Jesus Christ could sit on a throne in Jerusalem as if Jerusalem was rebuilt. And it was. Before it was a, a ruinous heap. It was a wasteland. Not anymore. Here's Jesus Christ ruling. And look what it says here in Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah 2, 1 through 4. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. 
And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. And out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Verse 4, And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall lift up sword against nation, uh, shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now verse 5, O house of Jacob, <laughs> God is coming back. Jesus Christ is God. He's going to rule on his throne in Jerusalem. Before he could do that, it had to be rebuilt. When was Jerusalem rebuilt? When the Jews came back and founded their nation. I think it's utterly ridiculous for anybody to believe in replacement theology. I think it's just silly and horrible for anybody to come along and say, there's no such thing as Jews. The nation of Israel doesn't exist. There are no Jews. God's not going to go back to dealing with the Jews. When everything we read in the Bible is a promise of God going back to Israel. And the Bible even tells us that Jesus is going to sit on his throne in Jerusalem. Well, how could he do that unless it was rebuilt? Who rebuilt it? The Jews. The nation of Israel. Now, Luke chapter 1, verse 32, speaking about Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Now look at verse 33. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. How can he rule over the house of Jacob forever if Jacob no longer exists? Have I made my point? I think the Bible clearly teaches that God is not done with the Jews. I don't know who the Jews are. I can't go to a person and say, Oh, you're from the tribe of Dan. Oh, and you're from the tribe of Judah. And oh, look at you. You're a Zebulun. Uh, no. All I know is God knows who they are and where they are. And he promised to give them that land. So they must exist today. Otherwise, how could God, Jesus Christ, rule over them if they didn't exist? He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Revelation 19.16 uh, He will reign with a rod of iron. Revelation 19.15 Who does he reign over? He reigns over the whole earth. He also reigns over the house of Jacob. The Jews, Israel goes through the tribulation so that God can go back to them. Just as he promised to give them the promise of the land. And there has to be a seed to give that land to. Otherwise God would be a liar. Because he promised to give it to the seed forever. Alright, let's go to Romans chapter 11. Mostly what I've given you today are Old Testament references. But I want to give you a New Testament one as well. This is the Apostle Paul. Paul tells us clearly the same exact thing that I've just told you. That God's not done with Israel. In Romans 11.1 1, it says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. Is replacement theology true? Is God done with the Jews? God forbid. No, no he's not, Paul says. God forbid, for I am... I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God had not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Now you go down and you read a little bit more, verse 25. He tells us the plan of God. 25, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. <laughs> Anybody who refuses to accept what I've taught you today are wise in their own conceits. <laughs> wow. And they're ignorant. That's what the Bible says. And it says that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Verse 26, And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away godliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant, my covenant that I made unto them, unto them, which I shall take away their sins. So how do we look at Jews today? Well, verse 28 says, As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. So God has not forsaken Israel. Israel in 70 AD was cast out. They were scattered. They were dispersed among the nations. And there are people out there that will lie to you and say, And now God's done with them, and they're no more. And there's no such thing as Jews. The Bible says otherwise. The Bible says God made an everlasting promise 
to give them that land, so they must exist. And when we look at history, we find, oh look, all these people are coming back in 1947, and then in 1948, they set up their own nation, and guess what? They call themselves Israel. There must be some of that seed there. And God says he's going to rule over the house of Jacob. And Paul says, blindness in part. Well, when they came to the early church, they were preaching to Jews, and the early disciples were saying, hey, believe in the Messiah, believe in the Messiah. Well, they rejected the Messiah. So God let Gentiles get saved in the church age. Now, the Bible says there's going to be a rapture. And the rapture is to take the church out. Why? Because why would the church go through the time of Jacob's trouble? <laughs> it's called Jacob's trouble, not the church's trouble. God's not done with the Jews. Place with theology is a lie. It does away with the promise of God and makes God a liar. And I just don't see how anyone could believe in replacement theology. So I've tried my best to do this sermon. I wish I could have given you the gospel. The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Look it up. It's all about the blood, salvation by trusting in the blood atonement of Christ. I hope this has been a blessing to you. Um, next week I'm going to talk a little bit more about Israel. But I want you to see we're in the last days. We're about right here before the rapture. And when that rapture takes place, you need to keep your eyes on Israel because God's going to be working over in that area doing a lot of stuff. I mean, two witnesses show up, there'll be 144,000. There's going to be a lot, of, there's going to be a war. There's going to be so many things happening. And it's all going back to Israel. This is not my opinion. This is what the Bible says. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.